I've had two different like eating disorders. They're both on the opposite ends of the spectrum, but they they were both pretty detrimental. So in that that picture of me being really skinny, I was 160 pounds right there on the top right. That was at the, that was right before um, my graduation in high school. But already I had started suffering from binge eating disorder. So I got down to that weight um, by starving myself. I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Welcome back to another installment of Iron Therapy. I'm Dave Palumbo, joined by our RX Muscle Staff Psychotherapist, Leslie Timble, and our special guest today, Mr. USA, Joe Palacio. Welcome. Hey guys. I'm back. Hey. Mr. USA, I love that title. I told him when I interviewed him the other day, uh, I love that title. And, uh, you know, Joe told me a very interesting, you know, little story when, as I was interviewing him, and I didn't know this about him, but he, you, Joe, you suffered with a, and you still struggle with an eating disorder. I wouldn't say I still do, um, but uh, it took me till I was uh, about, it took me about two years, three years to get over it, but uh, I did for quite some time. Now, we just interviewed someone recently, also was another uh, top bodybuilder who also was struggled and he, he even to this day still struggles with it. And I and I see that, and Leslie and I see that a lot with bodybuilders. And bodybuilding a lot of times gets people off of eating disorders, you know, because yeah. it's so strict and regimented. Um, but give us give us the backstory. How did it all get started? Just for people who might not have seen the first interview, and, and let's go into it a little more in depth. So one one thing I actually didn't mention in the uh, the first interview was I actually started out as a very, very like heavy kid. So to put it into perspective, I was um, in, like in third grade, that's about nine years old. I was 136 pounds, but I mean, I didn't, that was a product of what my parents let me do. You know, I, I had no idea that I was an obese kid or anything. I just knew, like, I, I know that weight because I remember being weighed for the first time ever. And uh, well, not the first time ever, but just that number sticking out to me because all my friends were like 60, 70 pounds in third grade. And I was like, why is my number so high? <laughs> you know? So um, I, I kind of like started to understand that I was way heavier than normal. So, um, but yeah, so that's the background um, to start. I was a heavy kid. And then, uh, you know, as you get older and stuff, like I had to lose weight to play in youth football to make weight for that. Um, so they, actually always, have weight, they actually have a weight class for the football? Yeah, in youth football. Yeah, you see, that's third grade right there. That, yeah. That just yeah. popped up. Oh, just to break down this picture in particular. Right. I had, so I've had two different, like, eating disorders. They're both on the opposite ends of the spectrum, but they they were both pretty detrimental. So in that, that picture of me being really skinny, I was 160 pounds right there on the top right. That was at the, that was right before um, my graduation in high school, but already I had started suffering from binge eating disorder. So I got down to that weight um, by starving myself. After in the first interview, I said that my coach at the time died me in that manner that really messed with my head and how I t looked at food and all that stuff. And so I got really, really, really skinny, and I even got even skinnier than that picture. Um, I got down to 145 pounds. That picture, I'm 160. Right. Um, put it in perspective, I'm 250 pounds right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you actually look good in that top right picture for a high school kid, right? You know, I mean, you probably like the way you look there, right? 
I I felt I looked too skinny. You could see my ribs and stuff. I mm. I was uh, forty pounds heavier than that when I played football, and then I was right. even two hundred and thirty pounds at one point my junior year. Um, so that's how much weight difference that was that everybody saw me lose. And then right there on the bottom left was pretty much where. So once I got to my skinniest, I ate my way back up through the binge eating disorder right there on the bottom left. Interesting. And that's that's the chubbiest I, I really got, but my body didn't really get past there. And then once I was like, once I got through all that and stuff, that's the very first time I ever got lean. That's after I lost my dad on the bottom right. And I finally figured it out. Um, my, uh, my mental state was good and I was able to be the bodybuilder that I am starting there on that bottom right picture. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, the, that's when you're starting to look good, look like a real bodybuilder. So, but, and yeah. what do you think prompted? Were you getting ridiculed in school at all? No, no, no one ever like, you know, like the, the guys would mess with you and they would like, like when I was chubby, cause remember yeah. I started off as a chubby kid and I lost weight through football, but none of that did any mental thing to me. It was the story I told later on about the, the transition from football into trying to be a bodybuilder and the way he taught me how to do that and stuff. And, um, but no, no one ever, like my older brother would pick on me, you know, call me fat and stuff, but it didn't really mess with me at all. It didn't do any mental damage. So when people hear that as a kid, you know, that you're the fat kid, I mean, that, that, even if it, if, you know, he kind of laughed it off at the time, don't you think that has some kind of a subconscious effect on uh, you? I would say so. And that's why, you know, like, uh, yeah. once I got into football, like it wasn't really the drive to be skinny, but it was like, I wanted to be athletic in football. And so once I lost weight initially, it made me feel good. So I was able to keep yeah. it off. Like, and then through activity and stuff, and then I started lifting weights. I told you my body just responded to everything. So it was put on the back burner, all that fat kid stuff. But of course it, it does hurt your feelings. Like I had no confidence when it came to talking to girls or anything. I'm man, no, no girl's going to want a fat kid, you know, but it, it does I, want, it does I don't want your feedback. Fat. I want, Le I want to hear what Leslie has to say about this because I definitely think it shaped your personality. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Leslie. thing, whether, whether you're an athlete, you know, regardless of the sport, whether you play sports or not, there's something called emotions, you know, so we go through, and including even happiness. Sometimes actually people binge, you know, when there there's a happy moment, it's not just necessarily the sad or the anxiety and it's binge eating. And I'm not saying this is the right way of doing it, but it becomes basically a way of emotional regulation. Like how do we deal with our emotions? So when you're talking about that transition, whether, you know, you're able to accept it to a certain degree, let's face it, family can get to us. All we need is a vulnerable moment and they can say something at the, just the right time to get to us. And what do we do to cope? We want to feel better. So that's like a quick fix. So it's a, a lot of binge eating. I'm not saying for everybody, but it is a lot of, you know, emotional regulation. Yeah. You know, the fact that he was heavy as a kid and, you know, to be called a fat kid, even by your brother, you know, you, you know, it plays with your, your mind later on down the road. Well, of course, you know, like, yeah. I'm sure that's, I'm, that's definitely one of the driving factors. <laughs> you don't want to be that factor. <laughs> I, it's like, I'm sure it's in a, you know, a culmination of a little bit of everything, like certain moments yeah. in my life that yeah. definitely, like we talked about, you know, losing my dad and all that stuff. Like yeah. it's all built me to be who I am. Every part has a role, you know. Evan sent the Pawnee when I, you know, I worked with him when he turned pro and, and you know, and I've interviewed him innumerable times and, you know, he was a very heavy kid when he was a very chubby kid. And I, even to this, this day, I think that Evan eats perfectly because he's so worried that he's going to go back to, even though he knows it's not going to happen anymore, but in his head, he, he feels he has to, you know, eat perfectly and, you know, you know, make sure everything's structured in, in his eating program because he doesn't want to be that, go back to being that fat kid that he was when he was, you know, when he was picked on, you know, as yeah. a kid. And uh, obviously, he, he like you, he had the great genetics for putting muscle on once he actually started eating right and training, you know, and putting it in a, in a positive direction. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I don't, you know, at the beginning of the podcast or this interview thing, it's, uh, I said, I don't feel like I deal with it anymore. But at the same time, I think no matter what, 
you'll always have a conscious mind of food. I'm not necessarily afraid of it or anything. It's just a matter of like, I definitely want to look a certain way. And um, I, I can't just eat blindlessly like like a normal person, I guess you could say, ever in my life, no matter where, I live, bodybuilding or not. You know, I think I'm always going to be conscious of what I'm about to put into my body. So do I have to weigh it? No, but do I want to know? Right, the but that's what makes you successful too because you, because you are so structured, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so it actually, it turned into a good thing. Leslie, you know, when people are dealing with, you know, being heavy as a kid and then, and then you know, changing, you know, their whole way of eating, you know, getting control of their life, changing their physique, what, what you know, and I'm going to ask you, Joe, this question, but I want to see what Leslie says first. The mindset. So, you know, here he is. You know, he said, you know, it was hard to talk to girls when you're out of shape. Now he's a guy who looks good and he's probably, you know, desirable. Do you still, in your mind, do you still see yourself as the fat kid when you're talking to girls, you know, when you started, you know, obviously dating and stuff like that? Or were you feeling more confident in yourself because people were giving you more attention now? The longer I was away from being that fat kid, yeah. the more I was able to adapt to my new self. But at first, yes, 100%. Like, we're talking it's taken years to get that image of what I was to what I am now. But, I mean, what helps, though, is that uh, through that, you're also it, – it, it's uh, – I like to be optimistic. So because I still saw myself as that fat kid, it helped me to, like, develop my personality. So there's a confidence outside of a look that comes with the look now because I had that psychological – mind frame about being stuck in the, that that look but it has taken some time and i've adjusted to what i look like now more compassionate you think too because of that you know because you know like sometimes kids can be cruel and it's not because they're necessarily bad kids they just don't know any better they're just stupid you know but mm -hmm. when you were on the other side of it sometimes you can you have more compassion for you know people because of you and aren't I can recognize cool it a kid. mile away like Anytime someone's like, they'll, they'll play it off. I'm like, nah, you're not fooling me, man. Or even just the eating disorder thing. There's certain patterns or ways a person talks instantly. And I've like, without calling it out, I can think of two people in the back of my mind that have come to me and told me how much they appreciate it. Like I'll give little, little like insights on things to where I make them see what they're doing differently. And they'll recognize like, damn, like this guy read me like a book. And they've told me I saved their life. And uh, like I said, on top of my head, I know two people. And it's like, they're like, how did you know? It's like, you know, it's one thing to uh, read a book, but it's another thing to live it. And you can just, you can just call it. You just know. So it, it's a one of those, like, I, I'm a huge believer in God. He puts the strongest warriors through the hardest, uh, you know, battles because that person can get through it and he can help someone else, you know. And I've been blessed to be able to uh, do that for those two people. And that's that's as far as I know. I have no idea who else I've helped, but I know for a fact those two I did. <laughs> you know, all these shows help people because when I, I get I get a lot more feedback as the host than you might get as the uh, athlete because maybe people are intimidated to talk to you. But I get a lot of people telling me that these shows you were really three hundred pounds at one point, Dave. They were intimidated <laughs> to talk to you too. <laughs> yeah, but not anymore. They forgot. He, people have a six month memory nowadays. You know that. Yeah, they yeah. Know people, people, people don't forget, Dave. Months. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. if you don't compete for two years, Joe. If you don't compete for two years, people will be like, "Mr. Who? Who is he?" <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I they forget you really fast. You got to keep yourself relevant all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good that you were able to rewire your brain and you know it's kind of like even though you're doing the right things you're able to implement a structure it's getting your mentality to catch up with your feelings with that structure because you can do all the right moves and still like feel like a fat kid you know it's like you know i remember tons of times when i went to university i'd tell these girls you know hey you look so beautiful like no i'm not i'm ugly I'm like, you know, it's like they haven't caught up because even though, you know, it's a little bit different, but I mean, it's, you can go through the motions, but for you to buy into it, and I don't mean you're selling yourself. I mean, buy into like really genuinely adopting that mindset. You have to believe in yourself and it does help when you have some, you know, criteria, meaning some type of validation from other people to say, Hey, you look really good. Or you can also see other measures within yourself to saying, Hey, I can, you know, I look really good in that tank top or, you know, I can bench or, or I can, I can leg press, I can squat. Like you have measurable quantities 
to give you some concrete measures of giving you that confidence. So it needs to come in from within yourself. So we call that internal validation as well as external validation. When that happens over a period of time, then your confidence can go up and then you can really genuinely adopt that. And that can give you a really, a really strong sense of courage and strength. So you can help other people and tell them this is not an overnight process. Even if you do all the quote unquote right things, it does take time and that's okay. Yeah. And you know, what's uh, the biggest thing, like I'm sure we'll get to it eventually, but um, what helped me get through the binge eating thing, because I was, that was even harder than the, the, I guess you could call it the anorexic. Why don't, so why don't you explain what happened, Joe? Why don't you, so you, you started, you went on this crazy diet and it was just making you insanely hungry and you started doing binging, right? Tell us yeah. So, okay. So, Real quick, I, I got put on, I wanted to be getting into bodybuilding after I stopped playing football. And so I went to this this guy who was kind of known as the fitness kind of coach there in, in high school. And um, he taught us to do pretty much like cold turkey, going to zero carbs and then do all out cheat days on the weekends and then go right back to zero carbs. Those cheat days turned in, those cheat weekends turned into cheat every single day. And then those every single days turned into all days and I was just so food focused. It, it really messed me up and I couldn't stop eating because I kept starving myself and then refeeding myself. But with the worst foods, like, you know, like the cakes, the cookies and all that stuff, because I was depriving my body of sugars and it was cold turkey. So it was just like a shock to me. And then um, after that, it like scared me because I couldn't stop. So then I started starving myself because all that little um, all, like I would say I put on probably like 10 or 15 pounds, but I just started getting really soft. So I started starving myself and I didn't know, have any nutritional guidance or anything. Like I didn't know how anything worked. And I was like, you know what? I just want my abs. And so I just ate very little and I ate all the way down to like, I told you 145. Yeah. but I was just further depriving myself just like that diet was doing. But um, in a worse manner, because now, I have zero energy. There was no refeeds. There was no nothing like that. And so I, I slowed my metabolism. I, uh, my, my trip, my, my health was deteriorating. My, tri my triglycerides got really low. I was cold all the time, pale, um, stuff like that. And, uh, once I started allowing myself to eat again, I couldn't stop eating. Like I would, uh, try to like do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but that breakfast was <laughs> went ran into lunch and ran into dinner, and then I would go to like the store and buy all these snack cakes, and I just couldn't stop. And then my body, like it's crazy, but within the span of three months, I gained eighty pounds. My skin hurt to touch and everything, but I ate my way right back to my pretty much my heaviest weight in high school. So about 222, I think was what it was or something like that. From 145. So my, my body was just going through it. But the thing was, once I got back to that weight, I, I was pretty damn chubby. Like my fear was came to life. And every time I tried to re-diet, it would re-trigger that binge eating thing. So anytime I put it in my mind, I was going to diet automatically my body, like, just fought me really bad and it was a combination between the body and the mind so it just they kept clashing and um so what i had to learn was to let go not necessarily of my my ultimate goal or dream of this bodybuilder look um but was to put it on hold because if you're not mentally ready to take on something like i do now you'll never succeed and so i i literally I had to stop looking at myself in the mirror, accept what I looked like, and stop, like, just whatever I wanted to eat, I just ate it, no matter right. what happened. I stopped weighing myself for, like, over a year. Um, I stopped buying clothes. I just wore whatever. You know, I, I just looked at myself as Joe and not a physique. And it really taught me how to love myself for who I am and not what I look like. I had a girlfriend at the time and stuff, so it really taught me 
like a personality over everything. Like I made plenty of friends. So I kept all my friends. Like I had nothing to do with my physique. No one give a damn what I looked like. And I really like fell in love with who I was. That took two years. So I had to look like I did and learn to love myself in that time span. And so I stopped caring what I looked like. But I didn't go off the, like I didn't get any worse looking once I got back to that uh, set point. And um, again, like there was a there was a time I saw my friends at the beach and they were fit. And I looked at my ex at the time or my girl at the time, and I and I said, you know what? I think I'm ready. I was like, I haven't really like cared to uh, to diet or anything, but that's really motivating me to get back into it. She was worried, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a lot of research. So, well, even before that, I still held on to that dream of what I'm doing right now. So I, I was learning also. I was learning about the disorders. I was learning about, like, how to approach, like, uh, nutrition and different ways to do things. And um, the very first time I got lean in that picture that I, I told you guys in the bottom right corner I actually did the if it fits your macros approach. So I didn't deprive myself of anything. I was just in a calorie deficit. And I never stopped weight training, by the way. I did for a year after the, after that skinny photo. I did for a year. But I went right back to it. I always worked out. So that's very important, I think. I, yeah. I always lifted weights. So even though I was chubby, there was a foundation of muscle underneath there. Because, you know, food is fuel. You, I'm sure there's... Pro, there's plenty of protein in the foods I was eating, you know, not max, but it was there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I always trained hard. It's, that's always been a passion of mine, so that's why I want to be a bodybuilder. But um, what's it called? Uh, yeah, I, I learned how, like, different food groups work. I learned, like, say the binge eating thing. I told you guys I would, I would go after cakes and stuff. That just told me that my body was – it was deprived of sugars. You can find sugar in fruit, like, you know, a, a better option. It's not necessarily, we just associate it with like cookies and cakes and candies. No, it, it can be found in good whole natural foods. And so just learning about the nutrition and how to diet properly and stuff like that, I wasn't really depriving myself anymore. I wasn't also trying to get anywhere quick. So when it came to the getting lean approach, it was more so learning how to enjoy the journey and not try to do it overnight. And so I, uh, there was no crash dieting anymore. It was like, I already enjoyed training. So all I had to do was be in a deficit long enough to get to where I wanted to be and fix my body. So that's kind of how it all came to be. Question, Joe, did you do all this yourself or did you talk to anyone like a, like an expert or anything like that? Or was this all just stuff that you kind of came up with on your own? I did all by myself. I was, uh, there was one day I was, I was on the floor <laughs> and it sounds kind of funny, but it's really sad, but I was on the floor in this room. Again, the girl that I was with at the time was sitting on the, the, the bed and I was eating peanut butter M&Ms. Those are my favorite. Those are so hard to not continue <laughs> eating once you started. It was like a five pound bag. It was a family pack bag. <laughs> that wasn't for my family. That I was the family like that. <laughs> that was yeah. I was just shoveling them down, man. I broke down crying. I was like, what the hell like, am I doing? Like, What have I become? It's like the worst of it. And I was like, I need to fix myself. I need to fix myself. And she came to console me. She hugged me and held me. And I was like, you know, like I appreciate you so much. But at the end of the day, like, you can't fix me. I have to fix me. No, People can give me advice. I can read a book, all this. But it's all going to come down to self-application and the discipline to be able to do this. And... It wasn't to diet. It was to accept myself for who I am and stop getting so stuck as uh, in the that vanity portion of it. And um, it was for, like moving forward that day. Like I decided, ultimately, ultimately, it's up to me. I have to do it. Um, so no matter who I go to, what advice I'm given, they don't do it for me. And that's kind of why I just took the approach of. Taking it upon myself to learn. Um, I would read things. I would watch YouTube videos. No one in particular stood out. Right. But um, it all came down to I just need to love myself <laughs> and, and stop being yeah. so stuck on my look. Right. And, um, yeah, that's what uh, that's what I had to do. Let's, leave. If, if, let's say Joe had come to you before he, he did his own self-therapy, essentially. I mean, would you have given him similar advice? Or, I mean, what – could you have made that process easier for him if you if he would have been talking to someone like you? 
Well, I think it helps to vent and be able to talk to someone who knows the industry. So I, first of all, I want to commend you, Joe, for being able to do this on your own because you do what we call body image work. And it's exactly what you were saying, which is just addressing and challenging, you know, our own, and we all have it, negative body image perceptions, right? Like how many, how many bodybuilders look in the mirror and say, I love the way I look most of the time, especially if they're getting ready for the show, they say, I look like shit, you know, and it's not that they look like shit. It's just sometimes we have that. Um, and it's not necessarily when you're in prep only, but I call it, you know, prep brain, but even, you know, off season, it's like, we always want to make improvements, which is fine, but not to internalize it. We are not, our identities are not just our bodies. Our identities are more than that. But as far as some other things I might ask you to consider, Joe, is uh, what we call self-monitoring. And all that means is, you know, keeping, let's say, a detailed journal of your eating patterns, uh, binge episodes, any purging behaviors, triggers, emotions, thoughts associated with any kind of bulimic behavior. If you can identify what your patterns are, it can help you gain insight into what could turn into a bulimic episode. So it's kind of saying, how do I prepare for this? How can I have the red flags? And then once you identify these triggers, and, and these can be situational factors too, um, what we can do is challenge and reframe those distorted thoughts in that uh, negative kind of thinking with, let's say, positive self-statements. We can talk about um, basically training yourself to go through a tempting situation where you would be bulimic in the past, train yourself to do something else. So you're exposing yourself to the very trigger for preparing a different alternate, obviously healthier way of managing it. Because I don't want people to feel like they have to be afraid. It's the, if I, if I come across that trigger, I'm prepared mm -hmm. because I've got like a list, like I got my toolbox, basically I'm ready to go. You know, it's like people go camping. They've got mosquitoes. I got my raid. I got my citronella. I've got my that electric jacket. Like I'm ready to go. Like I'm not being afraid of this. It's yeah. like, you want to come and get me, come get me. I'm ready for you. So it's coming on with a very challenging, I'm going to take you on obviously with strategies versus, oh crap, I hope I don't fall into that pattern of thinking. So it's, it's taking it up a, another notch by being prepared and proactive on what you can do alternative measures rather than being afraid. I can't do this because I'm afraid of looking like that. But like I said, that's good, but we need to level up. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Joe. Um, when you would do these crazy binges, would you keep the food down? Would you throw it up? Would you go over exercise? What, what was your like uh, methodology, I guess? Um, at the beginning, I, I, I didn't like, there was maybe one or two times I made myself throw up um, like, and that's over the span of a lot. So, I mean, I never really like got bulimic from it. I nice. would, however, I guess it's a form of bulimia. I would try to overexercise and starve myself the next day. Um, like I remember there was one day I didn't, or there was one time I didn't eat for two days and I exercised extremely hard. And um, that, that never happened again. That was, that was terrible. Um, but it wasn't an on, ongoing thing. It was like, that's what a total of three different times that I remember that happening, but I never like the, the, I didn't know how I was going to get through it. And I, w I was giving up, you know, like, uh, mentally I was getting, I was checking out, but I didn't want to succumb to that, I guess, you know? So I, I just, I never like, I just never gave up and I, I would hide behind alcohol a lot. So I think that's why I wouldn't do those things often. Cause I would drink a lot uh -huh. and then keep in mind, I would also drink around this time because of my dad passing away. So it just kind of, it helped me cope with it and helped me not care. So like those binges and stuff, because I would do the alcohol, I wouldn't care to like throw up and cause I, it just took my mind away from everything. So yeah. some of the, some of the, those those things that come from binging it i didn't really experience it too much but i i had like a an escape in a way because of another traumatic event in my life that happened so 
I didn't really deal with that too much. Tell us how you finally dealt with the uh, death of your dad. You know, and I, I've talked about this before. You know, I, I took me twenty years to deal with the death of my mother, so I I can I can understand sometimes where you know you just kind of suppress the pain and you know put it away somewhere. But uh, what what truly helped me deal with my dad was um, so what we're talking about right now was was becoming the man that I believed I could be, and I knew that man that I envisioned would would uh make my dad extremely proud and so that helped me deal with it working on myself day in and day out accomplishing the things that i knew i was capable of accomplishing that helped tremendously because uh doing what i was doing made it so much worse <laughs> so yeah. it was definitely a night and day switch um, once i started doing that and then i was able to cope with truly cope with him leaving how old were you when he when he passed uh, 22, 22. All right. So I was already experiencing this, this disorder while he was around. Yeah. So it just, uh, it, it, it still made it very difficult to deal with the disorder as well as now he is his death. But, you know, in hindsight, because of the death, the alcohol kind of got introduced and it made me forget about what was going on in those moments. So I didn't have to deal with like the, the throwing up and, all those other things, so give and take. Right. Leslie, let me ask you this question. Um, because I always worried, I always, what I wondered about it, about myself, but then, you know, obviously I proved it wrong, but, um, you know, I was, I was a runner, I wanted to be super skinny and I would starve myself. And I, and I basically created my own eating disorder just because I wanted to be so thin and I, my body really didn't want to be that thin. So, I, you know, whenever you start starving yourself, you start doing wacky behavior, right? Because your body is rebelling. Once I got into bodybuilding, I didn't have to deal with that anymore because all I did was eat. <laughs> bodybuilding. You're not hungry when you're always eating, you know, in a sense. <laughs> and I was so disciplined into my eating. And, and even to this, you know, even to this day, I, I'm the same way. And uh, food just is not as important as it used to be. But when you can't have something, that's when you want it, right? And when you're in emotional pain, I find that um, people do stuff to quell the pain. And you had mentioned this earlier, Leslie, that some people eat. And I'm sure Joe had that as a certain component also. But then, you know, also alcohol and drugs can be used also to kind of numb the pain as well. Um, how do you get past something like that, Leslie? What I mean, so he had like two issues at the same time, which um, could have made themselves terribly you know, worse. And, but in his case, obviously, his intellect and his desire to be, you know, to be successful in bodybuilding saved him. But maybe other people wouldn't be as, as uh, lucky. What do you do in a situation like that? You got to go to the core reason for the issues is the, the issue isn't necessarily the drinking itself. The drinking is a manifestation of the right. core issue. So it's about going into, you know, a lot of the grief. Is there any resolved issues there? What about some thoughts? How to be able to move on? So sometimes it, we almost have a guilt complex of the whether it's I didn't say something I should have or whether it's, you know, I want him to be proud. I hope he's proud of me. It could be, you know. Why am I not thinking about him more, even though it's been a number of years? There's a whole bunch of things that go into play, and it's going to be different per, per person. That's why individual counseling is so important, because no one's situation is exactly the same. And right. it's looking at the factors as far as what was going on at that time, as well as why is it still resonating with you? Not necessarily literally today, but, you know, in the present moment. So it's actually uncovering the real cause, the underlying cause not just the manifestations of the behavior, because once you get the cause, then it's easier to be able to go down a, a healthier route. The reason why people can't usually make the right choice is because, again, they don't go down deep enough as far as what is the underlying cause, not the superficial cause, the underlying cause. So for, for Joe, it'd be like, you know, the stuff that's going on with his father, a lot of the stuff that with the transitioning of the mind about not being able to accept his body for what it is and celebrating the strengths that he does have and to say, what is within my capability of being able to bring that up? Basically, we need goals. We need a purpose. We need some type of thing to kind of keep us accountable and move forward. If we don't have some type of destination point, even if it's short term, we get lost, we get complacent, we fall back into old patterns of behavior. And a lot of times when you have a coach, a therapist, we need that accountability because we're not usually in that place that we can be accountable to ourselves. And Joe was able to do it, but I'm wondering if he had someone like myself, 
he might have been able to get there faster. And that's important, I think, is, is a, to make a point because, and that's really the point of this whole show is that, you know, you don't always have to do everything yourself. You know, I think a lot of us are like very into the self reliant thing. I, I'm the same way, uh, Joseph. <laughs> you know, I think I can, if I do enough research, I'll come up with the answers, you know, on, on what the solution is. But, but Leslie makes a good point. Sometimes you can save a lot of time and a lot of grief just by finding someone that you are comfortable with and talking it, talking through it with them. No, it makes perfect sense. That's like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a personal trainer. So right. we always, we all, that's what we preach. It's like, look, you can spend yeah. all this time doing it on your own. Cause I wasted a lot of time, just like we talked about with nutrition mm -hmm. and stuff. And yep. I went down a bad path, you know, but um, if I would have had the knowledge of somebody guiding me, I'm sure you can cut that time more than half and get to where you want to be faster. So same concept, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Leslie, um, if, someone came to you and said you know what i lost a loved one you know I, i'm having bad body images about myself um you know where do you start do you start with the the the, the emotional pain like the death of the loved one or do you start with the actual you know problem they have maybe with an eating disorder or or body image i mean or do you do everything at once basically it's whatever they present with me first because on one day it might be the the, the grief of their of their loved one the next right. day or the next time I see them it might be with the eating so I'm very present oriented as far as where my client is and that's what we focus on now if there's time I try to touch on the other area but again it's really focused on where they are at that moment and that's really important because if they're more in the grief and I'm going into the other realm it's right. there's going to be a disconnect and that's not going to be helpful right. so I get a lot of cues from my clients Joe, if you had to give advice to anyone out there listening to this who might, you know, have, they don't have to relate exactly to what you're going through, but maybe they are relating, you know, maybe they were the heavy kid when they were, and they were maybe picked on, or maybe they lost someone and now they think, well, my life isn't worth living. Like, what do you, what do you recommend? Like how do you, you know, what would, what techniques would you suggest that they do? I always tell people if you're bodybuilders, the best thing to do is go into a contest diet because it takes your mind off everything. You're just so preoccupied with food. But, you know, how do you snap people out of it? What would you say would be a, a good thing to do? I mean, like you said, like we use bodybuilding. They can use whatever hobby they they go, you know, like really well, most focus. people watching this are going to be bodybuilders. So, you know. Yeah, I yeah. So, but focus on your passion, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you wake up in the morning and think about and go to bed like what you're researching what your what your social media consists of that is something you need to gear all that focus towards and once you do that you know everything kind of goes out the window like you, right. it becomes like your almost your purpose and um things that the the, you're, the blinders are on and the things on the outside kind of fade away so yeah. you create a create a focal point and just focus on that like i said my my goal the whole time was to be that bodybuilder even with that two-year time frame where i was trying to get over it it was to achieve what i'm doing right now so i never gave up on it i remember uh, i went i went to the movies watching pain and gain with the rock I'm sure you guys right. have seen that mark Wahlberg. Yeah. and i mean the rock everybody knows who that is so we know what he looks like um i remember watching him in that movie and i told the girls with the time i was like this is as I'm eating a cook, like a super fat Reese's cookie or something like that. I remember this vividly. And I was like, I, I promise you as well as myself one day, I'm going to be like that. I was like, I don't know how long it's going to take me, but I will not stop until I achieve that. And now I'm Mr. USA. That's so great. That's awesome. I, like I said, I just keeping that, that desire and drive for my passion alive and not giving up on it. And, and uh, that's the best advice I can give. Whatever you're trying to set out to do, make that your purpose and your priority. And eventually you'll get there. It's just a matter of when, you know. Yeah. So, and you know what? Sometimes you take your focus off of something you're so preoccupied on and put it on something else. The pain goes away from the other thing. I remember, you know, uh, this probably like the first really hot girl I dated. I was in medical school <laughs> and we broke, she broke up with me. Like I, she had some mental issues going on. She, she had lost her mom and she, you know, she was, she had an eating disorder herself. And, but you know, it was the, I think it was the rejection really that got me because, you know, 
I was still dealing or not dealing with the death of my mother. So I had this whole abandonment issue going on and I was hurting so much. And I remember I was actually in medical school and I had been doing a, a psychiatry rotation at the time in one of the hospitals. And I actually was, I actually went and talked to one of the, the, the psychiatrists there because I couldn't get, I couldn't get past this pain. And you know what, no matter what they told me, they're like, Oh, time will heal it. You know, and she, she was very nice, this woman. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to start dieting. So I started dieting and I learned very quickly that the desire to eat food was way greater than the pain that I was experiencing from this breakup. The breakup couldn't be, it didn't even matter anymore to me. All I wanted to do was eat my next meal. And, and ironically, that's when I met, as soon as you don't give a shit anymore, that's when I met my, um, uh, the woman I actually wound up marrying originally and back in, you know, I, I dated her for nine years, but, um, it, it, it's just kind of ironic. So sometimes just taking your, your, your focus off of what you're doing. And I think that's what you did essentially. That, when you that said, is you know what? I'm not going to eat. I'm not weighing myself. I'm not looking in the mirror. I'm going to eat what I want and that's it. And I, I got to take my focus off of this because bodybuilding because I'm too preoccupied with it. Yeah. So I told, uh, I actually told this to my, my, one of my really good friends and gym owners at a uh, fit nation gym art, um, that the day I lost my dad was the day I was able to become a bodybuilder. Cause if it wasn't the disorder, the eating disorder, that was enough. That was a cherry on top. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I need to, I need to start doing something because all this pain, like that I'm experiencing from all these things. I was like, I, in the interview I, I, I told the last video, it's either going to, I'm either going to continue on that path and end up like my dad or become the man that I, I envisioned myself to be. And so I just chose the other, the, the positive route and right. here we are, but I needed, I needed that distraction. I needed that almost just blanket over the fire. <laughs> you know, so and it, it helped me. Now, now I want to talk to Leslie about this because we just, you and I just relayed two experiences. When you do something like what he did or what I did to get past a painful situation, Leslie, did we really just mask the situation and not deal with it? And, 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 or was that our way of dealing with it? In other words, is it, is this going to rear its head on Joe at some point in the future? Because maybe he poured all his focus into bodybuilding now. He's not, neither one of you are ignoring the issue. You're just saying, what can I control? What is within my control? How can right. I make myself better? And by finding another Avenue that you can control versus stuff that's out of your control, that's actually healthy. So, you know, when you take, and if you, you know, here's the thing, it's not easy, as you guys know, it's a process, it's certainly not overnight. So what I tell people is if you're stubborn whatsoever, use that as a tool to make sure you do not give up on yourself, even if it's every moment of every day and you don't look beyond that day. You know, nice. uh, there's, a, there's been a couple instances where I've proven to myself that I moved past it. So. I actually had double shoulder surgery in uh, 2018. When you asked me if I had any hiccups, I decided to go the binge eating disorder route because of, I felt like that was more detrimental. The The double shoulder surgery, I had impingements and it created bone spurs and also had a torn labrum on, I believe it was my left side. So they had to reattach that, shave those down. I had to stop bodybuilding again. This is, once I got past eating disorders, keep in mind. Yeah. So there's another hiccup in the road. Yeah. But it made me a way better bodybuilder. If you guys like have seen my videos, I, I get hyped up about my chest a lot, how thick it is. Well, that developed after the surgeries because it made me understand how to connect the muscles, blah, 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 blah. But um, you, had, you know, I had the same thing. You had bone spurs. You couldn't you couldn't push past that 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 catch. Yeah, it would hurt. Right? I yeah, couldn't even I, do push ups. I, it, by the way, you'll, you'll have shoulder replacements in 20 years. Just, just, I'm, just I'm sure, but you know what? We're going to ride out the good times now. <laughs> That's right. So, so anybody wondering why they never see me do a barbell press and stuff like that and do Smith machines and all that kind of stuff. That's why. So anyway, I, I um, know the whole story. Believe me. I know the ending already. I, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so with that said, um, I had to stop bodybuilding. Right. And this is after the eating disorder stuff when I'm like, okay, I'm good now. So I, I couldn't do what I was keeping me blinded. So when I realized that I didn't fall back into my old self, my old patterns and stuff, that's when I knew yeah. I was able to eat like a normal person. You know, uh, I was so conscious about what I would eat like, but I would eat like out with my friends and stuff. I wouldn't 
calculate anything. I just, I just ate. I stopped when, you know, like a normal person, I wouldn't be caught like crazy about it. And I, I stayed the same weight, you know, I didn't like shoot up, shoot down. Like I just, my body melted as far as like my muscles got all right. soft, but right. it is what it is. But that that's when I knew that I was like, okay, it's no longer like this safety blanket. I'm actually okay. And then um, with my dad situation, we literally had a whole conversation about losing them and stuff. And I was all right. Like that, that's been six years ago now. Right. So I've done the things that I, I believed I needed to do to get over those things. And so, and then if you look at my off seasons, I don't know if I have any pictures of how big I really get. I posted on my story, yeah. but I get, I, I'm like a, I'm almost like a lead priest. I don't care how chubby I get. I can walk around <laughs> confident as hell. I really don't give a damn. And sure. so that's what I meant when I already, I don't, I put on a crazy amount of muscle mass in a shorter period of time. I actually recently put up a transformation picture from t- November, 2020 to um, recently now, but I, I got pretty heavy. It's not on there right now, oh, okay. uh, but I, uh, there's a, there's a transformation picture on my actual page when I was, uh, did my first show to now it's right there. Yeah. You can see it on the, left uh i'm not chubby there though but no i i I get chubby in the off season and that's the product of that on the right you know so it's just like i think you know that it's it's a means to an end it's it's not the end it's in other words you you're going to get a little out of shape but you're okay with that because you know you're going to diet down and lose the body fat yeah and and people that ask me hey joe like don't you miss looking like that and then like when i'm when i'm completely peeled and i'm like honestly I, I like being uh, fat and happy. <laughs> it's like I love having, I love being able to eat. I love, I love the energy, and I love being yeah. strong, and I love knowing that I'm progressing. Yeah. And so I, I don't even look at it as a look anymore. It's like I know the final look will be great, and I know I'll get right. there. But um, even, even at my heaviest, I tell everybody I'd rather look like this and feel like this than walk around like that all the time, because I just feel better. And then yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not so food focused. You know, I still weigh my meals and stuff, but I have my teeth not giving a damn. Like told you McDonald's and pizza, I don't care. Like it's a, it's a good place to be compared to where I was years ago. Yeah. You know, you probably have to eat so much food that off season, you probably don't have a binging issue because you're never really that hungry because you're always Fearless. stuffing food down your throat. Yeah. People don't understand that off season is way harder than pre contest. I think because it's harder to make yourself eat when you're not hungry than it is to eat when you're starving. You know, and that's just the, the, the reality of it. You know? I mean, I in hindsight, I've kind of prepared myself to be a bodybuilder. I've starved and got really skinny, and I've binge ate to the point of throwing up. So I, I have set myself up for success. To yeah. Yeah, there's nothing that you don't know already. You've experienced I, I went through hell, but I mean, yeah. man, it's, it's working now. <laughs> like, I'm doing the two extremes. Because every show, that's why, that's why when you guys saw me, you're like, hey, you're staying relatively lean. Like, like yeah. Because I know how to handle it yeah. from what I went through. And I, I just know that, um, like, eventually, you know, I'll get a little softer over time, you know, but because I'm trying to get better. Yeah. But um, if you can control the hunger and allow the metabolism to come back once you starve yourself for so long, eventually the body catches up. As we just said, my body dropped five pounds of water. So it's already doing exactly what we needed to do. And then because... I'm eating a little more over time. My body can adjust and acclimate. Just being patient and uh, and allowing the metabolism and everything to do its thing. So I don't ever go back to the. I feel like I need to stuff myself because I I'm, I'm starving. No, it's just eventually it'll go away, and I know that. And so you know, your metabolism really improves also as you get bigger. You know, you, yeah. you get to a point where you have so much muscle that you almost like you can't even eat as much as you really need to anymore. It's like holy macro, I can't get fat anymore. And that that I hit that stage at one point. And, and that's the I best. Can like, you imagine telling somebody with a binge eating disorder, yeah. worried about being fat, that they can't be fat anymore? Yeah. It's really hard. <laughs> that's pretty relieving, you, man. <laughs> you know, when I first started, when I went from running to, to bodybuilding, um, I was afraid I was going to get fat. And because it's part of the whole running thing was was a was a you know this desire to be super lean too. Little did I know. So I started adding more food and more food. I kept saying, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to increase food until I get fat. If I see myself getting fat, then I'll cut back. And it, it never happens. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I never and Ronnie was Coleman there. asking you why you're so damn lean. <laughs> it just never stopped. It just I no matter how much food I put in, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Muscularly speaking, I never put on body fat, like a, at least not a lot, you know. And so um, that was just my, my I found out that was my genetic gift. It was ironic that I was torturing myself with all this running, you know, and, and not even realizing that I had such a good metabolism. But, you know. That's, you know, that's I tell right, everybody. Right? I, I, Joe, I, I, I want to thank you for coming by and being so honest and uh, and talking about this subject with us because I think it's important, especially now that you're Mister USA. Other bodybuilders, if they find themselves in a similar situation, can can relate. Uh, you know, and I think that was very uh, brave of you to come on and, and share that with us. Of course, yeah, I'm an open book. It is what it is. Sounds great. Uh, go on uh, Joe's page, Joe Palacio, and uh, follow him on Instagram. He's got some great content on there. Leslie, thanks as always for all the wise advice. If people want to get in touch with you, Leslie, give me your contact. Check me out actually. On the neck. I'm on my neck now, so you can find it on my my uh, my profile on my IG. So certainly check me out. If you want to talk to me, send me a text, do a video call. I'm there for you guys. All right. Sounds good. That's going to take us to the end of another episode of Iron Therapy. I'm Dave Palumbo with Leslie Timble, Joe Palacio. We'll see you next time. I guess.